can white win in this position? In my article on chess.com, I looked at 10 types of positions where chess engines don't necessarily understand the positions better than the strongest human players. Now, under normal circumstances, the best chess engines are about a thousand ELO points stronger than the best human players. So these are certainly special types of positions that demonstrate some key elements of human creativity and ingenuity. Now, in this position, a chess engine will claim that white is easily winning. After all, white has an extra queen, two rooks, and two knights. But that same chess engine will not be able to suggest a winning plan for white. In fact, humans are often better in closed positions and in positions with long-term planning elements. Here, the long-term plan is needed to win this game. Let's break things down. Now, first off, the white knights cannot move at all. They are totally restricted by the pawns. Also, the white king can move, but it's not clear what the king's movement will accomplish. The rooks can also move and they can tempt the black pawns to capture them, and that would allow white to break through by giving back a little bit of material. But as long as the black pawns never, ever capture a rook, then it's also not clear what moving these rooks and offering them to the pawns will accomplish. It turns out that the only winning plan here is to play queen a2. Now queen a2 threatens queen takes b3, which will allow white to break through. But in this position, you can't play queen a2 because after pawn takes a2, black is going to make a queen on a1, and that queen is actually stronger than all of white's very clustered forces. The queen will actually come back here, and black is actually the one to win the game. Therefore, queen a2 must be prepared. The way to prepare it is to maneuver your rook around to c2. Once the rook gets around to c2, you're ready to play queen a2, and that will win the game. However, that requires a lot of preparation. Here, we can start with king over to d1. We're going to shuffle the king around and then swing the rook over to e2 so it can get over to c1. We're also going to need the h1 rook as well because it's going to need to help and defend the first rank once we sacrifice our queen. So now the king can go back to d1 and the rooks have made this orbit over to the c and e files as they danced around the white king. Now, with things in position, we are ready to play rook c2 first. Again, black is never in a position to capture a rook because that will unblock the pawn structure in the board and allow white to break through. So king b5 continuing to try and sit and wait, king over to c1, king back, and now queen a2. Finally, after 16 moves of preparation, we are ready for this move. Now, because of queen takes b3 here on the horizon, black must capture on a2, and the critical move is now pawn to b4. In this position, white is of course threatening to capture this pawn, so it's time for that pawn to promote. And after the promotion, you have rook to b2. This move traps the queen here on a1. Now, the critical question once we've achieved all of this is what happens if black continues to shuffle with the king? How do we make progress? Well, the answer is that we can just shuffle. Black doesn't have any moves but king moves, and so eventually black is going to run out of king moves and is not going to be able to continue to block the b pawn, which marches up the board and will eventually become a new queen, and that will allow white to easily win the game and deliver checkmate. This next position features some of the same ideas as in the first example. That example showed us a position where white was up oodles of material, but it was very difficult to find a winning plan. Here, we see a position where white must go down material, but will be able to hold with trap piece and fortress concepts. The computer is not very good at understanding trap pieces and fortresses. In the position, we see that white has two pieces under attack the rook on a6, and the bishop on c5. There is no way to save both of these pieces, but it is not necessary to save the pieces to save the game. White can play the absolutely brilliant rook to c6. Here, the rook is defending the bishop, and the only way to really push for a win is to take that rook. Now white plays pawn to b4. The idea here is to trap the rook on b5. It can go nowhere and white is able to shuffle the king between c7 and c8. Movements from the black king and black bishop will change nothing. 
However, there is a second stage here. Eventually, the rook is going to sacrifice itself for the bishop on c5. In that case, isn't the extra bishop that black has enough to win? It turns out, no. There's still a fortress in the resulting position for white. Let's see how that can develop. So black is going to encroach with the king and shift the bishop around and eventually sacrifice on c5, again, remaining a piece up in this position. However, here, there's no way to get the white king out of the corner, and there's no way to activate this black king, which is restricted by the pawns and the white king. Of course, the bishop also can never attack the pawns that are on dark squares. So black is able to shuffle a bit and try to make progress by including the bishop on a6 so that the king cannot go to c8, and the bishop can even come around the other side of the board. However, as the black king approaches and tries to kick out the white king so he can get around to get at the white pawns, eventually there is a stalemate defense, and this holds the game. You can try for a long time, but against the best defense, you'll never be able to win with the extra bishop. This next example comes from a human game. It's Anish Giri versus Maxime Rodstein from the European Club Cup of 2012. The following sequence is one of my favorites, and I covered it in my series on best chess moves about two months ago. It's also this example that inspired me to look for more positions in which humans were able to make clearer sense of the position than chess engines. So here, what did Gary do? Well, he found a beautiful winning plan, pawn to a4. Faced with the loss of a pawn on the queen side, but captures on a4, and now Gary plays rook takes c5. He's giving up two pawns in a position in which there's not much material left. Surely black is better or at least not worse in this position, right? Well, what matters is the power of this bishop and the immortality of the pin on the knight on f6. That pin is eternal. Gary emphasized that fact with the move pawn to f4. Now, white is able to win simply by shuffling the bishop between a1 and c3, and eventually black must move the king and lose the knight on f6. There are a few ways to win at this point, but my favorite winning idea is really to emphasize the zugzwang. So after pawn to a3, you play bishop a1, and as black tries to get ready to play g5, you just let black play g5, and then you play pawn to f5, emphasizing that black can do nothing in this position. After black runs out of pawn moves, eventually black will move the king and lose the knight on f6 and the game. This is another human game, Sikulski vs. Ravinsky from the Soviet Union 1938. In fact, pages of analysis have been dedicated to this game, but will condense everything for this video. Here, Black is trying desperately to draw with a defense that Russian players call the mad piece. There's a good chance you've seen the idea before. If white here makes a queen or a rook, then Black is going to perpetually check with the black rook. Eventually, white needs to capture, and that produces stalemate. Now, computers aren't very good at appreciating this kind of concept unless there's a clear perpetual check on the horizon. The basic problem for the computer is that in every single position, they're calculating the rook's sacrifice and saying, can I take that? Oh, no, it's stalemate. But a human player goes, one time, all right, I can never take the rook. And can I ever get out of this? And we're able to see in a lot of positions that there really is no way to escape all the checks. And as a result, we're going to have to concede a draw. Well, how does white get away from this clever defense from black? It turns out not to be so simple. For example, if you do nothing or kind of try to be patient in the position, then black is able to come back and stop promotion. And as you try to make patient progress, black always has good ideas to give up the rook and the bishop to draw once again by stalemate. Also, if you underpromote to a knight here, then the knight basically ends up trapped. Black is going to sacrifice the rook for the knight and once again, stalemate. So it turns out that the only winning idea here is to underpromote to a bishop. Of course, this is incredibly rare, but it's the right move in this position. Now, black is still close to achieving a draw with the mad piece, but with clever play, white can win. For example, rook c8 going after that bishop 
bishop back to e4, and now the clever bishop c6. The idea is to give up this bishop because if it's on the board, then you're not really dealing with stalemate defenses as long as white doesn't go to the back rank. Here, you of course can't take with the rook because the trade of rooks produces an immediate stalemate, so you take with the bishop. But now, black is able to try again for the mad piece defense, trying desperately to sacrifice the rook, force white to take, or concede basically a perpetual check, and the game will be drawn. However, here bishop a4, stopping the sacrifice of the rook, rook over to e8, trying for new checks, notice that the rook is hanging and that's not relevant at all because you're never taking that, king a3, rook back to a8 saying, I'm still going to sacrifice myself, and now the end. Rook to e6, a really beautiful, beautiful and brilliant winning idea. The point now is that there is no more stalemate defense because you will always have the idea to capture the rook. And capturing the rook is not enough to secure a draw because white has too many strong pawns and also this outside past b pawn. White is able to approach and here's a nice winning line. You approach with your king and your bishop, you get ready to push this pawn down, and if black captures, then the back rank is vulnerable and white is able to force pawn promotion winning the game. Very, very beautiful, incredible stuff. This next position was composed by Lazard. Now, if you've heard of Lazard, it's probably because he's relatively famous for having lost the shortest master chess game of all time. We're gonna replay that on the board at the side. But in addition to having that dubious honor, he also composed many incredible and beautiful chess studies like this one. I would argue that this one in particular is one of the most beautiful chess studies of all time. To draw this game where white is down a lot of material, you need to find an incredible fortress defense that holds the game. The computer will insist that black is winning, but in fact, there is no way to break through. Now, the first move is not so difficult to find, knight e4 check, and the point here is that if the knight is captured, then you have checkmate in one, a very pretty checkmate. But black can play king h4 here, and how is white to continue? If you play bishop e1 check, then g3 allows the king to maneuver, there are no more checkmates and no more stalemates, black wins easily. But after king h4, white has the incredible knight to g3 an absolutely brilliant move that sacrifices the knight in two ways and threatens knight to f5 checkmate. Of course, the king cannot capture because that again walks into the idea of bishop e1 checkmate. However, the pawn can capture and it looks like that should easily win the game, right? Well, no, incredibly, white can play bishop to b6 and this is the critical fortress the bishop will shuffle along this diagonal, and no matter what black does, there's no way to win. If you check on the first rank, then just bishop back to g1. The bishop blocks, and if you keep the queen here, then you just have a stalemate. And if you sacrifice the queen for the bishop and say, all right, I'm just going to win with these connected passers over here, then you can't actually win because the black king is totally trapped and can never involve itself in the game. It's really quite stunning. Additionally, you can't really make progress in the position by ever, ever pushing these pawns, even if you let off the stalemate, because white will always capture the pawns if they advance, and when the king, the queen captures on this diagonal, you again have stalemate because the queen will control g1. Let's look at what is considered the most beautiful continuation in this study. That is queen to f8, stopping knight f5 here, and now bishop e1, threatening knight f5 with double check and checkmate. So finally, black must capture the knight on g3. Pawn takes g3 and bishop to f2. The bishop is offered twice, but both captures lead to stalemate. And again, once you get to this diagonal, you have a fortress. There are some ideas to try to break through. For example, you can give up these pawns. Again, if you capture, you have stalemate and eventually you can try to win by playing queen f2. This does force a white to capture the queen here on f2, but after bishop takes f2, pawn takes, white finally has g3 check here, and whether you capture with the king or play king h3, it is again stalemate. 
White has incredibly held this position. I hope that you've enjoyed all of these incredible examples. I encourage you, if you like these positions, to check out the article, which has a lot more examples. Also, if you wanna see some incredible examples of computer ingenuity, then do check out our playlist with incredible computer chess games.